Coming up on this week in computer hardware, early Snapdragon 865 performance benchmarks. Your car and your phone are tracking your every movement. 280 hertz gaming monitors, and Apple gets a 9 out of 10 on repairability. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twist, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 545, recorded on December 19th, 2019. Your phone is a delete expletive spy. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most useful, most engaging, most delightful, most affordable mode. I am a little worried about tracking. <laughs> we'll get to that in a moment. The chuckling in the background is Sebastian Peake, editor-in-chief PC Per, who may have discovered that... Uh, there are things even he can't snark about, although I think we'll both manage in this particular case. It is the penultimate episode of Twitch for the year 2019, and uh, there's a bit of news, but we're in that sort of lull before CES when everything gets swamped and uh, overwhelmed. Um, I was uh, delighted that you had a few new stories up on PC Per. Uh, we'll get to the tracking stuff later. We yeah. won't get into the idea that Facebook is now building their own operating system or in the early steps of because they don't want to use Android anymore. Because really, when you can build a complete lack of privacy from the ground up, why wouldn't you, Facebook? Um, uh oh, you're supposed to be snarking today, not me. Um, <laughs> we, yeah. there, there's Let's we're going to do an entire show about that. We don't have to get too deep into that because, of course, if you think about it. Google is basically doing the same thing. They have they don't have right. the social media platform, of course. That was not a success. But they definitely have the predominant mobile platform that most people use. And they're collecting a lot of data, whether they have social or not. So it's kind of like yeah. they, they kind of took the Microsoft approach in a way, where they became the operating system of choice for all the vendors out there. And then... You have companies who've like flirted with or developed internally their own operating system alternative like Huawei. So I would love to see, I guess I wouldn't love to see fragmentation because then where would the app ecosystem go? And that's where you get trapped because to use the Play Store, you need to be running Android. Right. So. Well, part of that, though, is, of course, these they're talking about using it for Portal. They're talking about using it for Oculus Rift. Um, we'll see. We'll see whether or not they actually fix it, finish it, because um, if building an OS is one of those things that always seems to be more complicated uh, than anyone realizes it is. And, of course, there's also the strong possibility that they may build an OS, they may ship it on a couple of products, and then the whole weight of the process of building an operating system may collapse on itself, which is had for damn near every television manufacturer has done their own operating system. Or, or consumers may complain so fervently about the lack of support for apps and stuff, but uh, it, it's a good article. That's actually a pretty good article up on uh, a TechCrunch worth reading. Worth reading. Um, the I think the most surprising news uh, of the week is probably that iFixit, who has been a sponsor recently uh, of this week in computer hardware, uh, got a nine out of ten in a repairability score, um, which is something that's really unusual for an Apple product. Uh, but most oh, yeah, we're of talking the about the Mac Pro, new Mac Pro. Yeah. Okay. I, I couldn't resist this also because it's a, just to see the guts of the Mac Pro spread out across the table is always kind of fascinating and charming. Um, but literally, uh, most of the most uh, repairs or upgrades don't actually require any tools at all, which is always a big plus. Um, so they've actually they can do it. Now, obviously, I will be the first to admit that a desktop computer uh, is not a phone or a tablet and they have to be built differently and they're difficult to secure and nobody at this stage is asking for IP58 uh, you know waterproofiness or dust proofiness out of a desktop computer um, but uh, you know there's a there's a bit of charming snark in there or where they yeah. make a lot of references to it can't be that easy it doesn't require a proprietary tool um, but for the most part it is shockingly uh, thoughtfully arranged and uh, easy to repair, which in many ways, once again, makes it the antithesis of uh, the not so much lamented trash can Mac Pro. So props to Apple for proving they can make something that's easy to repair. Please feel free to make my iPhone a little thicker and a little easier to repair in the future. 
speaking of uh, phones, uh, was it Anantec who did the breakdown on Snapdragon 865 performance? Yeah, uh, well, the one I linked to. A few different editors were invited out, and this is what uh, basically Qualcomm does every year now. Their tradition is to bring people to Maui and show them the upcoming Snapdragon hardware every December. And uh, the Snapdragon 865, we've talked about this before. It's their new SOC. It's going to be in those flagship phones next year. We also mentioned that they're basically not going to give it to the phone manufacturers unless they also take their new 5G modem. So the 5G branding is right there with all of their, you know, uh, marketing for this. And they don't have 5G testing or anything with this initial look. It's just whatever benchmarks the Anantech editor could get done on site with prototype hardware. So that's always the, right. the asterisk. It was their prototype hardware. I've done this, uh, I think, at least once back when they were still doing it in San Diego. And the prototype hardware at that point had gotten to the point where it was basically a phone. In the previous years, it was this really thick right. device that looked like a beefy like digital audio player, not like a phone at all. My uh, year doing it, it was a 6.2-inch smartphone that was about as thin as a current 6-inch phablet was at that time. That was like 2016. And this uh, apparently is another similar pre-production device. The only questions are things like, you know, power management, how will the phone actually, like, how will the SOC actually act inside of proprietary enclosures and with the, the sort of performance limitation that you get because of thermals, the overextended workloads and stuff like that. But just looking over some of the benchmarks res results for this 865, you'd expect it to be faster than the previous version of the Snapdragon, like, high-end SOC. It is considerably faster depending on the workload you're looking at it was impressive to see pc mark work 2.0 overall uh some of the scores were were fairly close but you get into things like photo editing which are obviously a very big deal i think a lot of people a, a huge focus of their smartphone experience is the camera and you look no further than the pixel phones the people who adopt those who so often say that camera is the most important thing to me in a smartphone uh, camera performance, photo editing is something that Qualcomm, uh, they have their own uh, DSP and it's it's been getting better. It We talked about before the fact that it can now support up to, I think it was like a 200 megapixel camera, but basically the processing is a lot higher and they have dedicated processing for, for that image signal processing and the, the editing and the performance there was significantly higher than we were looking at the previous flagship, like in the Google Pixel 4. And mm -hmm. interesting note, of course, any of the PC mark results, some of the Android only benchmarks are not going to have any iPhones in there anywhere. So you have to kind of look around the reviews, right. including this one, to see uh, platform agnostic tests. So when they're running Web Expert 3, that's Apple, iOS, and Android. So they have the iPhone, and the iPhone pretty much dominates. So it's, it's interesting to see the, the dichotomy here where you have Android-only stuff and how they stack up. And really, if you're on the Android side, you're probably not. I mean, Apple results, it's just like a checkbox to you, whether you can say, like, right. our platform is faster in this test. Really, you wouldn't, if you're not on iOS and you don't like Apple's ecosystem, you're not going to switch sides because one was higher <laughs> than the benchmark chart. But right. it's worth noting. I mean, when, when Apple actually gets to go up against android with the same benchmark they do have a huge advantage because they own the operating system and right. they have so few models of phones think about it even though there's there is more to choose from on apple's side now with phones right there's still only a few models it's like four models well, a big part of it is apple had acquired one of the primary um arm platform performance firms long time ago uh, they've done, you know, they've they've thrown a fair of, amount of money at performance. And yeah, like you mentioned, um, think about the kind of increases we've seen from updates to uh, graphics drivers. And then imagine having the ability to optimize everything in your hardware, yeah. software, and operating system. And yeah, that's, that's absolutely an advantage. Uh, also, you know, the simple fact that most of your end users are actually going to get those updates, um, which is still kind of a fantasy on a lot of... Uh, uh, at least on the operating side of things on, on Android devices. But 
um, it's interesting to watch. It's interesting to watch this stuff gets revealed and, uh, you know, we move forward towards the next generation of outrageously big or foldy or bendy or just yeah. skinny smartphones. Patrick, I have a question for you about this. I, I've i okay. been reviewing phones and looking at phone benchmarks for years. I find myself, maybe it's just age creeping up on me, but I find myself caring less <laughs> about performance benchmarks with smartphones and I care more about its overall reliability, longevity, right. And just its ability battery to do the life. things that I need it to do, like battery life. Yeah, battery battery life has battery life and camera. I think have become the number two, like the one and two things for me when considering any phone. And then after that, it's platform and ecosystem. Like, okay, well, how many family members use iMessage? Am I going to get kind of trapped into using <laughs> that with them and all of that right. kind of stuff? But I don't really I care if it's one position higher than another phone in a benchmark chart anymore. The it, it, for for all intents and purposes, um, I don't. Dues. If I was doing more high-end gaming, especially some of the the driving games, um, or if I was actually editing video on my phone, I might care more. But the reality is, is there's way more. You know, for most most phone apps are like running Word. Doesn't take a lot of processor power to run Word. Um, I'm actually, uh, you know, cameras a, a much bigger motivator for me. Um, battery life is a much bigger motivator. And actually, to be honest with you, uh, memory. I don't want to ever own another Android phone with less than uh, three and preferably four gigabytes of RAM. Because once I started to use a more high-end Android phone, I was like, hey, this memory thing. Switch between apps. Fast and painless. <laughs> um, oh, and you know, I know overall... for you, storage is a big deal, too. So, yeah. Would you, would you ever, uh, ever buy a 16 gigabyte phone again if you couldn't upgrade the storage? No. No. Uh, I haven't. I mean, I've I haven't bought any phones smaller than 64 gigabytes since the first 64 gigabyte iPhone. Um, you know, I mean, if I could have found the 256 gigabyte version of this when I bought it, uh, I would have picked it up. But they were, uh, there may have been one, possibly two, in San Francisco, but there was no way to actually know. So I took the 128 gigabyte phone in front of me rather than possibly driving across the river, the river, the bay. And finding out they didn't have any in stock, um, but I, I, and to be honest with you, on Android, I I pretty much there's you know I would love to have a Pixel, but the storage is a no go for me, uh, or the lack of storage. So it's interesting. Um, 208 hertz gaming, not something I expected to hear a lot about. At no. least one company is trying to to uh, who's going to use gaming at this frame rate? Obviously, Twitch gamers. Um, yeah, but esports. Yeah, you know, ten. I mean, what is it? A 1080p monitor, or or is it an actual resolution that I care about? He says coldly, and harshly. Yeah, I. This, well, it's, this is, I don't think they've actually officially announced this. That's the thing. Like we're getting this. This is a story okay. from Texas, and it's it's they've found listings for it with like official looking graphics and marketing from Asus in China. This is only in China so far. And it's right. the Tough Gaming Series VG279QM. And it's nothing special. If you look at the specs and you weren't looking at that panel refresh, it's a 1080p 27-inch IPS monitor. These are hmm. You can find those for south of $200 anywhere. And that's not that, well, maybe not for the 27-inch. I think that 25-inch range for 1080p is pretty cheap. But it's a 27-inch IPS monitor with a low resolution. Max brightness of 400 uh, nits, 1,000 to 1 static contrast is what they're claiming. But it's an IPS panel. It's like the max pretty much for IPS. So it's not that impressive until you see that they have somehow managed to get this panel to 280 hertz. And we've seen up to, I think there's a couple of 240 hertz, somewhere in there, uh, range panels. A contributor of ours actually just submitted a review, I think, in the last month of one of those, the the latest right. ROG Swift monitors. You're up to like that 240 hertz range. To see 280, I'm just curious how they're accomplishing this. If it's if it's true 280, if this is like if it's marketing and it's something like what Samsung used to claim, where they were using a, like I think LG did this too, where they would use a combination of backlight blinking and a high refresh rate to claim a higher effective refresh. But if they've overclock one of their 240 hertz panels and have that going at 280 i'd be pretty impressed but even at 1080 
it's going to be hard to run games. Like, think about this. You have to average yeah. a frame rate that matches your monitor refresh rate to have a smooth experience. And to be able to lock VSync on 280 frames per second to match your monitor, you've got to be playing at the lowest imaginable settings at 1080p with a very high-end graphics card. I don't, I don't even know if an RTX 2080 Ti at 1080 is going to hit 280, depending on the game. I mean, older games, sure. So if maybe this is all DirectX 9, uh, low complexity games at low detail settings. But I, I'm not surprised this is being advertised in the Chinese market first because this seems to be targeting um, like professional gamers. It's a previously unseen esports gaming monitor is how the article titles this. So <laughs> Coming maybe soon. Certainly. Yeah. We've uh, both been playing around with, with uh, 5 and 10 gigabyte Ethernet cards um, for quite some time. I don't think either one of us are running 5 or 10 gigabyte cards at home. Uh, the PC per Unfortunately, crew no. no. were in the past because it was one of the ways to move the ridiculous amounts of data that were generated by the, the, the frame weight benchmarks that uh, Ryan put together. Um, Serve the Home has a look at a sub-$50 uh, NIC or 2.5 uh, gigabit Ethernet NIC. And uh, mm -hmm. that raises interesting possibilities and also questions. For example, the one that always dogs me is finding a router, a, a not a router, a switch, or a router yeah. for that matter, but mostly a switch that will actually support that kind of bandwidth. What's uh, what's the word from Serve the Home? Well, I, I will talk about this TrendNet adapter, but this was also partly a platform just to get up on the soapbox a little bit about the lack of a switch, like you alluded to, the fact that, and I've talked to at least one company. I remember I had a conversation with the folks from uh, Killer Networking, mm -hmm. Rivet Networks, and they work with a lot of OEMs. Like uh, MSI is one of their partners, and MSI will typically have that whole like killer solution on one of their top end motherboards, like the uh, the what was it called, the Godlike, the X570 Godlike motherboard, and right. th that includes like a 10 giggy a Qantas chip, and it also has a 2.5 giggy solution and a gigabit Ethernet. So mm -hmm. if if you have access to a motherboard that has 2.5 giggy, you can actually use the same cabling. I think it just requires CAT 6 or higher. Uh, and it gives you more than double the speed. The problem is finding a way to get everything connected and take advantage of that. And while gigabit was a huge step forward. I mean, literally, you went from we went from 100 to 1,000. It seemed like a giant right. leap. But you're limited to about 100 megabytes a second, which may sound like a lot until you think there are a lot of internet connections. Well, not a lot, but if you have fiber, you can already do that just downloading something. And to be connected to another device in your home or office and still be chugging along at up to 100 megabytes a second, we start moving around big install files and things I'm moving around an 80 gigabyte, maybe even a 100, 110 gigabyte game. It's right. crawling because best <laughs> case scenario, if I'm if I'm on a wired connection, I'm getting about 100, 110 max sustained. And to look at charts like this, like this trend net, Nick is using just a real tech chip. It's not expensive. That was one of the things that Rivet kind of was explaining to us like they were selling to companies like Dell. Dell was putting their chip in in uh, like the Aurora desktops and stuff. And they said the the additional cost of these companies is minimal and we can just enable 2.5. I think the problem has become the fact that there is an additional cost associated with this. So when very little in the way of hardware out there supports 2.5 or 5 gigabit per second mm -hmm. switching then why would they bother spending the extra dollar or so, whatever it is, to upgrade a <laughs> NIC that cost them just a few cents, but a gigabit chip right. in there? So I think that's been the problem. But seeing something like this is great. It's an actual finished product that ships. It's from TrendNet. It's a company you've heard of. It's under $50, and it gives you an easy drop-in PCIe Gen 1, or Gen, not Gen 1. It's Gen 2 or 3, but it's a buy one card that'll put it, it just about anything can take this. And if you look at their results, which I had to double check, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. They, they were just directly connecting to PCs. They had two of these cards. They connected them to, to 
PCs. Then they ran a cable between them and, and ran these benchmarks. And yeah, the one giggy stuff was running just over 100. And this was running just, well, a little over 100, like 120. And then this was running at about 250. And it's, it's, hey, that's as advertised. And of course, it all depends on your cabling <laughs> and, you know, the PC itself and the card and some other factors. But essentially, if, if we saw routers come out, like starting at CES, for example, that just had all 2.5 uh, on the back instead of buying a router with a WAN port and four 10 giggy or oh, I'm sorry, gigabit <laughs> uh, ports. Right. That would be the game changer. It, it's just not mainstream yet. We've been talking about this. I think we've been talking about 10 giggy for at least four or five years as being something that was accessible in right. that you could buy the cards. They're, they finally came down to where you could buy them for around 100 or less each. But the, the switches are just so expensive. Uh, I think it's yeah. Microtech uh, that has a switch that's under 250 Oh, really? But, yeah, and it was Serve the Home that reviewed that. I've been kind of checking them for any kind of networking updates because it really caught my eye. This Microtech is the brand, the CRS309-1G-8. Dash dash <laughs> plus the plus sign i n uh yeah that we're looking at right now that one which has some really beefy uh silent cooling by the way it's nice that this one yeah, is uh, not actively cooled it's got a big heat sink on the back couple of copper heat pipes this thing has a street price of about 230 dollars when you can find it and it gets you into that 10 giggy world and i'm well i have been very I mean, tempted by one of these but you know go ahead there have been, I mean, there have been, it's funny because uh, there have been, uh, there have been several more mainstream router companies that have had like one or two yeah. uh, 10 gigabit ports on relatively, you know, sub $300 switches or sub $300 routers. But, um, you know, the interesting thing about that is, is if you are moving, you know, if you have some particular server, it can be helpful for, you know, one port sounds silly. What am I going to do with one port? Well, if you have a particular server that backs up all your data and you want more bandwidth to go between the machine and that server, stuff like that is is a possibility. Um, you know, it's it's messy and it's still pretty expensive. Um, but, you know, it's almost in the neighborhood of kind of being affordable. <laughs> We, yeah, we will continue I, for the next four or five years. I mean, but part of it's right is you don't most people don't really need that bandwidth. Um, I think I think, it's the, I think part of the problem is that it, it's become. We were like dinosaurs because we want to use a wired connection. It people don't seem to like mainstream. I don't right. know anybody who uses wired for anything. It's it's just so convenient to have some sort of a mesh network or just a, a router if they're not into a mesh network then running cables to everything is something that you, you still see, of course, in business and you right. still see it in offices. And it, it's essential for any kind of operation where you're moving a lot of data around a lot because it, or if you, you have you just have. I was say if you, or, I mean, it's I, I know people who do it sort of more through the AV Excel side of things, right, because we have people. Yeah. Who, I, I know people have like, you said to connect my thing with an Ethernet cable, and I did, and I don't have that problem anymore. And it's like, well, great. And you didn't have to spend, you know, $400 for a mesh routing system. But it's amazing. Uh, yeah, it, people people will deal with the worst wireless problems just in a half to pull an Ethernet cable. Although in many cases, pulling an Ethernet cable is a nightmare, uh, especially if you're going between floors of your house. You know, yeah. I mean, it was great in the, you know, in the house I used to live in because there was a crawl space in a single floor. So, you know, all I had to do is like drill in one side, drill in the other, pull the cable down, walk it over to where I was going, you know, mount the, the ties to the to the floor joists and I was done. But, you know, if, if you've ever had to pull cable between the floors of two houses, you, you know, a really exciting definition of irritation and pain when things get complicated. But. I borrowed a very high-end router earlier this year just for some quick uh -huh. testing, and it was the the Net, Netgear Nighthawk AX12. This is a very expensive, yeah, ultra high-end, the latest tag. Oddly enough, the one I was thinking of before. <laughs> yeah, and it's I, I don't remember how much it actually costs. Somewhere between four and six hundred dollars, I think. 
And it's if you look on the back, there's a couple of of ports you can aggregate somehow and get faster Ethernet if you do teaming. I'm not sure exactly. I didn't even try that. There's one multi-gig port on the back. So it's five hundred dollars. OK, and it's okay. it's a one giggy or you can do two point five or five giggy. I I did a little bit of ten giggy testing just because I have uh, a couple of ten giggy cards and mm -hmm. was testing just throughput from the router. But all the marketing about this and most of the expense is because of the fact that it can do this ultra fast wireless where they have these theoretical maximums, which are unattainable. I mean, I think the most I could get right. out of this was 14 or 1500 megabit per second, which is still really fast. If you think about it, it's it's eclipsing the the 1000 barrier that you have with a cable. But that's really just a function of the fact that we haven't moved past uh, the one gig E stuff yet. So even even this super expensive $500 router with all the latest bells and whistles only had one port on the back that natively supported something above gigabit because they just expect you to buy this and exclusively use wireless. <laughs> so now it's, we literally look at commercial grade equipment, like yeah. professional grade networking equipment. And even Which at the lower cost, like that micro tech. Right. Yeah. And, and, and then there's other solutions. Um, there's like the optical stuff that I really didn't know anything about. Some some people in our community were telling me about it. And you know, there, there's adapters to go from optical back to copper and they're getting less expensive. But then there's issues with the right adapter with the right cable and making it all work and proper support for it. And it just seems like a mess. It And it's so much easier to just get either a mesh network or a powerful router, depending on what space you're in and just have everything connected. And you can even eclipse the transfer speeds of wired wirelessly. But I mean, mm -hmm. like you guys, like on the AVXL side, anybody who tries to do streaming content, if if you've ever AB tested them or gaming, you're going to get a better experience with a wired connection because the the bits don't have to be reassembled. Uh, all the packets <laughs> arriving out of order, which then have to be placed back in order. There's just added latency from wireless connection you do not have with a wired connection. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of times it works now, especially if you have a, a decent mesh rig uh, or you just happen to live in a place where, you know, the Wi-Fi runs smoothly. But it's 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 interesting <sighs> when it doesn't work, it doesn't work spectacularly. And as we move to 4K distribution, I think more people are going to find like, boy, they wish they really had a wire or they wish they really uh, had the money for a more functional uh, Wi-Fi system. Although I run into a lot of people who finally realize that, like, hey upgraded my router and things got better and if it's been five or six years since you've upgraded your router it might be worth getting a new one just to see what kind of uh updates and performance improvements it makes around your home to uh get a little negative before uh before we end the show <laughs> a uh -oh. couple of insane articles this week um are all around data tracking uh first one i want to give a shout out to uh uh, the ever charming Jeffrey Fowler over at the Washington Post, who used a Bay Area hacker who normally does forensic analysis uh, for recreating accidents. Um, so you basically pull the on the entertainment computer out of a GM, and uh, it's uh, to figure out what information it was storing. And the there's a there's a really a lovely lead graph on this story. Um, Behind the wheel is nothing but you, the open road, and your car is quietly recording your every move. And uh, so he was in a 2017 Chevrolet, 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 like Target. It is a fabulous brand. Um, he was in a 2017 Chevrolet, and it talked about how the car collected the phone ID, who he called. Of course, it did stuff involving braking and acceleration and uh, sending information back to GM over its always-on internet connection. And it's amazing, um, you know. It's this is one of those cases where automotive manufacturers have determined that any data recorded by the systems they built into your car that you bought for uh, belongs to them, and they have a free and clear, as far as they're concerned. It's our right to do whatever we want to with this, and uh, there's no way to know what your car is tracking uh, or what it does with it. And uh, it's kind of amazing, right? So, 2020, Mr. Fowler points out, almost every car 
being sold in the United States will already have a built-in internet connection. All Fords, all GMs, all BMWs, and quote, all but one model of Toyota and Volkswagen. You know, it was it's kind of amazing to realize what's going on there. And like the forensics uh, guy he was working with uh, had pointed out like, oh, you know, apparently uh, these he's seen BMWs with like 300 gigabyte hard drives inside of them. And while they were able to sort of grab a bunch of information off the infotainment computer, and it's not, it's a non trivial thing to figure out what this is, right? Because in the case of this, they had to like disassemble the dashboard and pull the unit out. They had specialized custom made circuit boards to grab information. Um, but that basically makes it almost impossible to figure out what these automotive manufacturers are tracking. And, uh, you know, Teslas are taking pictures of you. Um, there's a lot of pass around of information of who knows who and, uh, you know, everywhere you've traveled, for example, was was uh, when they when they got the information off this computer, which took two or three attempts. Um, unique identifiers for phones, logs of phone calls, contact list, uh, which you might give permission for your contacts to be loaded into the device. OK, um, but do you remember giving permission for for the car to track all of your travel? And, uh, you know, that's pretty crazy when you start looking at that. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, cars tracking your location, uh, even when you're not using the nav system, massive hard drives for storage. Um, you know, it's something worth thinking about, um, you know, the, uh, and, and one of the things that, cause Mr. Fowler talked to uh, uh, spokespeople from GM and, you know, what they talked about was like, well, most of what we do, vehicle location, vehicle performance and driver behavior, you know, and the line that he dropped was much of this data is highly tactical, not linkable to individuals and doesn't leave the vehicle itself. Um, so, uh, you know, they still uh, they still grab a lot of information. They still can do a lot of things. Um, and it's kind of curious to to sort of get a feel of what's uh, going on and the fact that they consider that they own that data and can keep it and do whatever they want with it forever. So I, I don't know. It's, it's part of a larger thing where we start looking at more and more information being in the hands of more and more third parties and being for sale on that one. Because what the follow-up to that was kind of uh, – um, was crazy is there was also a New York article or New York Times opinion piece this week where they had uh, a massive data set given to them by someone who was working for a uh, essentially a data marketing company and uh, and uh, you know if you lived quote if you lived in one of the cities the data set covers and use apps that share your location anything from weather apps to local news apps to coupon savers you could be in there too. And this was, is a mass, it was a tiny, tiny set of the data that this company has stored. But it showed the movement, essentially allowed you to track the movement in real times of cell phones in the Pentagon, the White House, homes. They basically identified the homes of certain stars. You were able to determine where people had been spending, they had spent overnight uh, or traveled or stayed for several hours. Um, and essentially, uh, uh, the the person that provided the the data to Times Opinion w was freaked out and completely freaked out about how much of this data was was being captured and what could be done with it. And then they, they want lawmakers, they want the public to know about this. And uh, you know, it's uh, you know it's crazy, right? Because it covers everywhere. It is poor rural neighborhoods. It is exclusive high-end neighborhoods. Um, quote, without much effort, we spotted visitors to the estates of Johnny Depp, Tiger Woods, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, connecting the devices to owners to the residents indefinitely. Um, and it's an interesting thing. Like, once you have that information, you just follow, oh, someone visited here, and then you follow that information down the line. And it's kind of creepy. Um, this is the kind of thing that, you know, the Soviet Union would have bled for um, and uh what's amazing also is how obscure the relationships between apps you use that that track your data uh and where it ends up and uh, yeah exactly because yeah, you're agreeing to, to you're agreeing to terms with so many different companies that all have access to the same hardware that you carry around with you everywhere you go 
So even if yeah. you think, well, I'm on a more secure operating system, okay, well, you're using an app that requests access to your GPS. Mm-hmm. And even if it's a weather app, like, well, it needs to know where I am to tell me what the temperature is, without me having to actually find and type in the zip code every time. Sure, then it's convenient and it's nice that I go to a different city, I fly in somewhere, I get off the of the plane and it says I'm in, you know, Los Angeles or wherever it is. And this is the current temperature, but that weather app could be subsidizing their costs by selling that GPS Mm -hmm. information. So you're a user. We know this about you. This is the device you're using and this is where you go and Mm -hmm. we know where you are all the time. So it, it could be any number of apps that you're using. What's alarming to me looking at that picture is just to think so many people are just living their lives wherever they are with a phone in their hands, probably staring down at a six inch screen just mm-hmm. all the time. And maybe it's in well, their pocket and they're traveling around, but still it's like, that's what we've yeah. become kind of as a society. So, Hey, they're going to figure out a way to use that data somehow to make money. It's interesting and terrifying. I mean, you know, one of the things the, 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 story points out is like a lot of his information is anonymized. Okay. Uh, but it's not particularly effective. Uh, and there's no, there's no laws on the book about what happens to this data. There's no regulation of this. Um, and you know, the biggest challenge has it, which has been for so many things in technology is that ultimately the security of the data or the information rests in the hands of individuals who have access to the data and their sort of moral compass or lack thereof. So if, you know, you know, could someone track an ex-girlfriend? Could someone be paid to track an ex-girlfriend or, you know, a victim of domestic abuse or any of a number of other things? Absolutely. You know, uh, and it's kind of alarming how that happens sometimes in the real world. Uh, (laughs) you know, there's, uh, you know, and they point out, right. The, uh, Companies collect this information. They're like, ah, you people, everyone who uses the app said they this was okay. Now, it may have been in page 73 of a 200-page user agreement that you click by without reading, but you said it was okay. And besides, the data is anonymous. We don't tie it to a phone or a name. And it's secure. Now, we've all seen, you know, there's the data security, I think, is just something you should assume doesn't exist anymore, given the amount of hacks that have taken place in large business organizations and government organizations. Um, You know, but when you look at at this data, they did this, and the story is beautiful, right? Because they tied in sort of like uh, satellite photos. You know, basically they did a lot of GIS work where there's satellite photos, the data's laid over that. And there's this beautiful thing where they talk about um, 10,000 smartphones being tracked in Central Park. And and then they picked one smartphone in this crowd of humans. And then they got all of the pings from that smartphone for the entire time the data was being collected. And then that basically allows you to figure out what's going on. For example, it's not guaranteed that if a smartphone goes back to a particular point uh, on the surface of the planet every evening and stays there for nine hours, it may not be their home, but it's a pretty good idea. Probably it is. And also, if you're just trying to track them down in the real world, it's a pretty good guarantee that if 300 nights a year they're in this particular location, that you can find them at that particular location. So, you know, anonymous is right up there with unlimited data. Well, technically, <laughs> it just doesn't mean it may, it may not be very practically anonymous in the real world. Um, but something to think about, two really, really good articles um, in the Washington Post and New York Times. Uh, the Washington Post article that Jeffrey Fowler did is called, oh my goodness, I shouldn't have scrolled so far. Uh, what does your car know about you? We hacked a Chevy to find out. And that New York Times opinion piece, which is uh, fascinating and slightly disconcerting, um, is location tracking cell phone or, uh, you know, just, just search for that on New York times and it'll pop up. It's, uh, fascinating and slightly terrifying. And speaking of dystopian futures where humanity mm. has been degraded into a dark, ugly corner of existence. The future, the Blade future Runner. of 2019. <laughs> yeah. Blade Runner. It's funny. I, I love the take on, you know, we used to think in, previous decades that 2000 was really futuristic. There was a lot of stuff 
with the word <laughs> 2000 in her story. It's about 2000. And then we and got it's there. It's almost 20 years ago. Right. We got there and it's like, oh, it's a little different. There's these advancements, but our lives, the way that things work, the fact that cars still move around the ground and aren't flying around. You know, we didn't get a lot of the stuff we were promised in science fiction in the 1940s and 50s. And of all, th- like, so the the joke is basically we should have picked 3,000 because we could still be looking forward to this <laughs> stuff. Like, 3,000 is so far off. None of us are going to be alive then. But 2,000, we've seen it. And it's funny because Blade Runner, of course, the classic 1982 sci-fi sort of noir movie. Right. Is it takes place in Los Angeles in 2019. So yeah, in 1982, that seemed like a long way off and they're flying cars and all of this new technology. And there are replicants who are essentially almost like organic androids that have been created that are so close to the real thing. It takes a trained uh, Blade Blade Runner, Runner, a trained officer to identify them using special equipment and, Anyway, if if you've seen the movie, if you're a fan of Blade Runner at all, uh, you probably are into that world, that gritty, noir world of their interpretation of, of Los Angeles in 2019. And it was directed by Ridley Scott. It has absolutely amazing cinematography and lighting. And it's just a, a, a brilliant movie, in my opinion. Of course, stars Harrison Ford. There was a game, and it was an ambitious undertaking. Westwood Studios, you may know them from uh, like the Command and Conquer series. They basically, internally, they pitched the idea to management. Like, can we make a Blade Runner game? And this was in the 1990s. Right. And, and they, they got approval to do it. It was very ambitious. They had to actually invent some technology to make this work. They were targeting, I want to say it was like a Pentium 90 Computer is the minimum system requirements actually right here in front of me. Yeah, 90 megahertz Pentium. So they were, they actually created something that had pretty dazzling visuals for the time. They had some interesting techniques they used to to have like uh, character models actually accurately reflect lighting. And right. if your character passes through fog or steam, they would be enveloped by it during like during their travel through it. And they, they came up with technology to actually make that work and work on pretty low end hardware in 1997. Mm-hmm. And the game, unfortunately d- was not a DOS game. 1997, this was the windows era. It was a windows 95 PC CD ROM game. And for yeah. the longest and time, very early in the evolution of that platform. Yeah. And, and for the longest time, just no one could get it to run. I found a copy of this first, uh, when I was out thrifting, Years ago for $5, got excited about it, brought it home. I couldn't get it working on anything. And I I jumped through hoops. I read about stuff. It just right. it was famously difficult to get working unless you had old hardware to run it on. And then in October of this year, the people behind uh, SCUM VM, and SCUM is an acronym. I can't remember what it stands for right now, but it was the the programming language that Lucasfilm developed for their early adventure games. Right. And it was the MM at the end of no stands for Maniac Mansion. It's like the scripting language for Maniac Mansion. And a lot of adventure games from LucasArts were run or were programmed using that language. And the Scum VM was a, a platform that allowed you to run those old games on modern hardware. And it's platform agnostic. It runs on everything. It's on Android. It's on Linux, Mac OS, Windows. And that team, apparently big fans of Blade Runner, they put in all the work to create compatibility just for this one specific Windows game. When Scum VM typically is, <laughs> it's hosting DOS games that use a specific type of programming right. language. And then all of a sudden, version, I think it was 2.21 or 2.10, it was called Electric Sheep, and it supported Blade Runner as the only Windows game that it supports. It was just crazy to me. And I actually went through all the steps of copying over my four CD-ROMs and <laughs> just the files that it said I had to have in this one folder and then point scum VM to this folder and get it running. And it worked. But now GOG.com, which is formerly known as Good Old Games, the website that sells these DRM-free, old, basically ready-to-install, pre-patched uh, 
old games that they have the rights to, they right. obtain the rights. So it, it's, I guess it's not surprising that you can actually buy this now and play it on modern computers because of the work that the Scum VM team put in. But it's just, it's kind of crazy to me. Like this was in legal limbo for almost two decades. This was a game that a lot of people thought was never work again unless you had some retro hardware up and running and had access to the original CD-ROMs. So for about 10 bucks, you can buy this now. And visually, it's a lot more impressive than I would have expected given its age. You, you play a lot of these older like DOS era games and they look really, really chunky and pixelated on a big monitor. I was playing this on a bigger monitor. And yeah, I mean, it's lower resolution. Anything right. VGA on a modern, like, high-resolution panel is going to look low-resolution, but uh, it scales up pretty well. And the lighting effects and the music and the dialogue, the excellent voice acting. There are moments where if you weren't paying attention, you would think you were kind of in the film. That's the whole purpose of of the development of this game was to kind of it's it's not replaying the movie. It's not the same thing. It's it's in the same universe and it takes place at the same time, but this is a side story. And what's cool about it is it's actually randomized. That's one of the things that Westwood Studios did was it's almost infinite replay value because who is and is not a replicant as you go around as a Blade Runner working for that same department that Harrison Ford's Decker character did. You don't know right. who is and isn't. And it literally changes every time you restart and uh, oh wow! Begin a new game. So you actually have to to follow the clues and you know figure things out again every time. So I I haven't played through the whole game yet, but it's very impressive in these early stages, and I'm I'm just happy that it's available again. So it shockingly and delightfully, it sounds like you were delighted and not disappointed by the experience. Oh, yeah, like uh, the fact that everything just instantly worked was kind of amazing. And then I was checking. I was being really picky. I was checking for like sync, like uh, on the cut scenes. Uh, I had initially in my when I was playing around with the scum VM, I had some sync problems if I was using Mac OS and that weren't there on Windows. But the, the video sync seems to be working properly, like the lip syncing up to the to the video the, no graphical artifacts, nothing like that. So. It seems to be pretty polished at this point for something that's only been supported since October. Sounds pretty awesome. And, yeah, definitely you know, check it out. Strikingly unusual. <laughs> yeah. That, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a couple last things to mention as we are in the tail end of the madness that is holiday shopping. Um, we've mentioned Camel, Camel, Camel a thousand times. It allows you to figure out uh, if it's the right time to buy something or if you're paying an inflated price for something on Amazon. Uh, it's, it's not a bad thing to check that if for no other reason than if you are searching for something and maybe you're looking at that third-party price or it only shows up from a third-party vendor, um, it can be nice to sort of double-check those prices or the price history on that just to see if what you're paying is reasonable. It's also fun sometimes to look at their popular search items to see what people are searching for if you're looking for gift uh, ideas. And uh, a tool we haven't mentioned in a really long time that was a big part of the great GPU hunt uh, back when. Remember when GPUs were scarce and you could never find one in stock? It wasn't that I've long ago. I've blocked that out. Um, blocked that period out of my mind. As well you should. Uh, now in stock.net. And uh, I, I put a link into the show notes of their Lego uh, items just because I always find the Lego tracking on that to be particularly amusing um, for reasons uh, only related to uh you know, my relationship to Legos question mark. Why don't you pick one of those, Kevin? <laughs> Lego movie, Harry Potter, doesn't matter. And dig down so you can actually see a particular item. And it lists, of course, all mm. of what is available uh, or where it actually you can out find of it stocks. in stock. Yeah, well, it, it is the out of stock time of year. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if you are looking for that, they can also give you tracking updates. I believe they also do uh, the ability to get updates, uh, text messages sent to your phone. And, of course, uh, since this is technically a show about technology and hardware in specific, um, 
and not Legos, although Legos can be occasionally very hardware and technical kind of in reality. Um, it will do GPUs, CPUs. Um, if you're trying to track down deals on consoles, you know whether it's a Switch or uh, an Xbox or whatever you're looking for, uh, now it's locked in that can help you kind of track what's going on and where to find it if you're having difficulty finding it in your area or on the internet. Um, Because I'm always amazed by where certain things show up that I wouldn't expect them to be for sale at. Yeah, So, especially hardware. Like you forget that certain stores even sell components. Like I'm looking at the Ryzen 9 3950X. Best Buy is one of the few places that actually has it listed for its MSRP of $749. It's out of stock right now. Mm -hmm. Newegg has it in stock but because they're selling it for eight ninety nine, there's, you know, it, it's been coming and going over the last few days. But it's nine hundred dollars, so they're marking it up one hundred and fifty bucks, which does help keep it in stock. But you have to pay that big premium to be able to buy it. But yeah, now in stock.net is something I've known about for a couple of years, where it's they do all the work for you instead of searching around all these different stores. Like, yep, here are all the stores that stock it, and here's whether it's in stock or not. There you have it. In fact, let me look at that Millennium Falcon. Because mm-hmm. nothing is more exciting uh, in video or audio programming than someone doing a Google Patrick, search. there are just too many pieces. How many pieces is too many pieces with a Lego set for you? Like, just is there any limit? I, I look at some of these packages, I 1,700 pieces. Like, I, I can't. You know, it was... It was interesting because it was the the crew over at Tested.com that got me into the idea of, of uh, building a giant kit as being a social activity. Um, so I'm, I'm tempted to experiment with one of these gigantic 9,000-piece kits uh, with the oh, boys on okay. Christmas Day. We'll see how it goes. Um, hey, and your kids are older, it, too. It's not like yes. my situation where if I had this at home, I could put 3,000 pieces together, and the next thing you know, it's just all over the floor. So <laughs> I can't I can't take that chance, Patrick. So I just I can't there even start can. the project. I have one of the giants. Um, it was the Mega Bloks brand, but it was the USS right. Enterprise, like the original series Enterprise. And it had been clearanced out everywhere. It was around, I think, seventy nine dollars when I bought it. And it it's so such a huge undertaking. The thing is almost three feet long when you build it. And it's just there's so <laughs> many pieces in that box. I took one look at it and said, I'm putting this away. I'll bring this back out in like two or three years and maybe then I'll get it started. But I couldn't I couldn't live with the idea that I'd start this insane project and my right. son would take off with one of the pieces or he would break what I built. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm crazy enough to build a thirteen hundred and fifty one piece Lego kit uh, inside the Airstream. But, you know. There's so many exciting ways to move towards divorce in any relationship. Why not yeah, try like <laughs> I know we can, we can have a whole podcast about that, too. Like, you know, there are ways to utterly fail in a relationship. And technology is this catalyst. It's a powerful catalyst for, uh, you know, relationship problems. Let me Giant let me speakers, thousands of dollars in amplification, you know. The computer parts that may or may not show up when the other party is at work and you don't necessarily uh, clear it with them before you make that order. You know, stuff like that. Not that any of that has ever happened. (laughs) This is sounding like, based on my knowledge of you, this is all sounding highly personal. (laughs) I'm just saying. Not at all. These are just... Hey, Random did you thoughts. ever buy a? Did you ever accidentally win a a, a truck in Phoenix uh, on on eBay and then have to go pick up the truck and drive it back? That would so, be very difficult to explain. I like to keep it low key. Brown boxes in the front step. What could this be? You know, it's <laughs> probably a review unit from some company. You know, so much stuff shows up here. It's very easy to uh, slip a couple purchases slip. in there for yourself. Not that I would. With that, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware. If you have a question for us, do us a favor. Email twitch at twit.tv. And a big, uh, a big, a big, and a quick shout out to Chips, who uh, pointed out that Washington Post article that I enjoyed so much and found so depressing. Um, But it's definitely, uh, it definitely, just read it. Send us your email questions. (laughs) CES is coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, Send us your, if you got questions about what's coming up or what happens or what shows up at CES with new hardware, Twitch at twit.tv is the place to send your queries. Uh, If this is your first episode of the show, hey, 
Congratulations. Thank you for joining us. If you want to hear more, we hope you do. Do us a favor. Go subscribe. Search for This Week in Computer Hardware on your favorite podcatcher or go to twit.tv slash twitch. You'll find all of our older episodes and information on how to subscribe for all of the different formats. If you want more Mr. Sebastian Peak, head to pcper.com. If you like more of me, go to avxl.com. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Sebastian Peak. Catch you next week on Twitch.